Okay, um, it's about 12.03, so I think we're going to get started. Um, my name is Andy Santa Croce. I'm the current president of the um, Penn State Everly College of Science Alumni Society Board and um, happy to um, be introducing uh, and welcoming everybody here to the Everly Science Exchange. I um, wanted to provide an introduction to um, our host here, um, Chris Palma. So um, Chris became the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Students in July of 2019. And prior to this, he was the Associate Head for Undergraduate Programs in Astronomy and Astrophysics. He continues to teach an upper division course for planetary science and astronomy majors in that department as part of his current role. Um, for the Dean's Office, he oversees the uh, pre-med and science majors Undergraduate, undergraduate admissions and uh, recruiting commencement and uh, the science advising and pre-health advising group and college programs that support careers and internships, education abroad and undergraduate research. So clearly Chris has a lot of free time on his hands after all that. <laughs> um, but Chris is a Penn State alum and a lifetime member of the Alumni Association uh, with a Bachelor of Science in uh, AS astronomy and in uh, physics from 1994 and completed a PhD in astronomy at the University of Virginia before returning to Penn State in 2001. Uh, before I turn this over to Chris, I'd like to remind everyone to use the Q&A feature instead of the chat feature to ask questions if you would. Um, you can type your questions into the Q&A at any time during the presentation. And if your question isn't answered during the presentation, Chris will answer it at the end. So um, with that, welcome Chris, and I'll turn things over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and show some slides. Um, so I'll share those. Okay. All right. Um, uh, it, thanks very much for this invitation. Um, I've been really looking forward to, to talking with everybody. Um, I'm completely happy to answer questions. So, so uh, you know, I really appreciate Andy mentioning that, you know, as they, as they occur to you, put them in the Q&A and we'll, we'll do our best to get to all of them. Um, it's great to see, I was looking at the participants list. I see some alumni that I've worked with over the years. Uh, from two years ago all the way back to, uh, I won't even say how many years ago. Um, so it was really nice to see some familiar names joining us today. Uh, and, and I just, you know, one of the things that I want to say is, you know, one interesting thing I've been reflecting on, you know, prior to giving this presentation. So next month is 20 years since I came back to Penn State. And, and it's hard to believe that it's been 20 years, but, but I think really the nice thing is that you know in all that time I feel like the College of Science, the community here, the the people that are here are just really special, and I just so enjoy working with the students in the college and the staff and the faculty, and and I'm just looking forward to to welcoming our our next class, which I'll talk about here in in a few moments. So I I want to start off, you know. So the title, right? The the thing I pitched uh, as a as a potential presentation was, you know, the College of Science by the numbers, and that that's a little bit, you know, maybe some of you are like, wow, is he really going to talk about that? You know, we don't want people to think that our students are just a number. So I I want to address that head on. What I see my role as, and everybody I work with here in the college, what we see our role as, our vision really includes, we want to make sure that students in the College of Science are successful. And we really want them to feel that that they are getting personal interactions, personal interventions when they need it, that that we are here for real one on one um, uh, uh, work on behalf of student success. So so I don't want you to think that, you know, when I'm thinking about the College of Science, it's all just a big number to me. Um, you, you know, I really do my best to learn everything I can about every student that I work with. And I, you know, I picked this particular uh, picture, you know, I, I recognize some names of students I've worked with, but I bet there's at least one person uh, joining us today who's worked with Dr. Jensen from, from our advising center. 
And, you know, if you've worked with her or you've worked with any of our advisors, you know that, you know, when you're talking to an advisor, they are there with you. They want to know your story. They want to know what it is we can do to help you achieve those goals that, that you came to Penn State to achieve. And so that's what I'm, one of the things I'm, I'm really proud of is that our focus is on student success. So, you, you know, I, I wanted to be sure I shared that context right off the bat, because I am going to talk now about some of the bigger numbers, you know, how many students join us, how many students graduate, but whether or not we're talking about those numbers, every they're behind all of those numbers is a name and a person and someone we're extremely uh, grateful to be working with here in the college. So um, Andy mentioned in the introduction that, that this office, the Office of, for Undergraduate Students in the College of Science, we have a lot of different roles we play in working um, with students, you know, to help them achieve that, that success that I was just talking about. And so when sometimes people ask me, like, how do you define like your job? Like, what are the parameters of your job? And I say it's one, it's student facing, student facing, student focused, but it's from admissions through commencement and beyond. Um, so, so, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about here in a few moments is, is welcoming next year's class of incoming students. But, you know, it's, it's an ongoing thing. We, we just finished, you know, awarding some scholarships and, and uh, um, we're, we're in the middle of new student orientation, which I've listed here, but we're getting ready for the app, the students who are going to apply for admissions for next year, the, the year after, right? So, so all those folks, you, you know, who have, you um, a student who's about to be a high school senior, they have questions for us about applying to Penn State, about scholarships, about uh, the different majors. And so we're gonna start doing events here um, in the next few weeks uh, for, for the class of 20, that will start with us 22, 23. So that's the, the future students aspect. You know, I'm gonna talk a bit about advising. You know, that's a key role um, for people in the college. Like if we want to make sure students are successful, they need to have access to an advisor who, who isn't just going to help them pick out their classes, although that's something that advisors are really good at and, and know all the ins and outs of, but your advisor really becomes a great part of your network here uh, of, of people who are looking out for you and can do things like connect you with all the different resources that are available at, at Penn State for, for different things. Um, I mentioned new student orientation is going on right now where, where all of those students who are going to start here in the fall are picking out their classes, uh, you know, getting to know us, we're getting to know them. Um, that's a whole process that takes from the middle of May through uh, the middle of August. Um, another really key aspect that, that I'm going to focus on towards the end of this is co-curricular experiences. There's a lot of evidence that the experiences students have that supplement the work they're doing in, in their courses, things like research, study abroad, um, doing an internship, et cetera, that, all of that makes a huge difference in their eventual success. So we have some staff who are specifically focused on those, those co-curricular experiences and they're under an umbrella of the, the Office of Science Engagement which includes um, programs uh, in, in study abroad and, and other global experiences. Um, one of the things that I have to do is, is and, and it's probably one of the most fun parts of my job is uh, awarding undergraduate scholarships. So I don't, I didn't have a lot uh, um, to say about that, but I'm happy, you know, if people want to hear more, but I'll just say that, that, you know, the great thing from my perspective is we, we have a lot of funding and a lot of individual awards that, that we're able to give. And I really appreciate uh, you know, alumni continually coming forward and saying, you know, we'd like to, to help you support even more students. And, and so that's been a, a, a really nice thing to, um, to work on. Um, one of the, you know, again, like everybody has the piece of their job that's like the, well, this is just the thing we do and it might not be the most exciting, but, you know, when it comes to graduation day, who makes sure that everybody who gets their diploma completed everything and everything's done we're, we're they're checked out so that's done by our office and that means you know one of the big pieces of that is being flexible right students have lots of different things that come up and you know we want them to graduate with a Penn State degree that we stand behind that says they really learned everything we wanted them to learn while they were here but 
but that doesn't mean we can't be a little flexible and we can't say, you know what, maybe it's more appropriate for the student to take this chemistry class instead of that one, right? And so, so a big part of the graduation checkout procedure is, is making sure that uh, um, everything was completed and any possible substitutions that were necessary were done. Um, and then we, you, you know, stamp the thing on the computer and people get their diploma. And then again, going back to the really, really fun parts of the job. Um, and, and I will say, you know, one of the really nice things this year was we were able to hold a, a in-person commencement ceremony in the spring uh, in Beaver Stadium. That was so much fun, even though the weather was pretty awful. Uh, the College of Science got lucky and we were not rained on, um, but being able to stand up on, on the stage they erected in the uh, south end zone and, and uh, congratulate all the graduates from the College of Science was a lot of fun. And I'm looking forward to uh, to our summer commencement, which is coming up here in a couple of weeks. So, you know, jumping into the numbers, I, I want to, you know, I, I wasn't sure, you know, do people know how many new students come into the College of Science every year? And, and so just, if you didn't know and you were curious, somewhere between 800 and 900 new students come into the, the college every year. And you might say, well, you know, you know, what's the limiting factor there? Like why not a thousand or 1200 or why, you know, not 500? One of the things that I'm sure many of you remember from your time with us that a lot of our courses are lab-based courses. So if you're in the physical sciences and you're taking, you know, physics 211, the, the classical mechanics course, you have to take a lab that goes with it. If you're, uh, you know, on the path to become an MD, you have to take uh, OCHEM, right? So, so all of those courses that you all remember with, with lab components, we have to have the space to conduct labs for all the students in our college, but also all those engineers who need labs, all those students in the College of Agricultural Sciences who need labs. And so when we meet with admissions and talk about, well, how many students do we think is best for the College of Science every year? It's really based on like, how many do we think we can give a good experience to in the, in the space and the facilities we have? And so that's where we come in around 850 is, is a pretty good number. I really wanna mention, I mentioned Carolyn Jensen from our advising center. Now I wanna mention Megan Holmes. Uh, she's the staff person that we call our future students coordinator. She oversees a uh, um, student organization that you see here. It's called the Science Lion Pride. So if, if you um, attend one of the tours that, that Penn State does out of the admissions office where you walk around and you see Thomas Building and the Hub and the Lion Shrine, et cetera, those are um, available through admissions and they give you a good sort of global picture of, of Penn State. But a lot of families want to hear specifically about the College of Science. What are the facilities in the college like? What are the majors in the college like? And there's no better person to give a prospective undergraduate student an overview of their potential future major than someone who's in it right now. And that's what Science Lion Pride does. So they, they will do tours specifically of the College of Science but they will also you know, meet one-on-one -on -one with a family who's, who's interested in learning more about uh, um, the college. Um, uh, just as long as I'm here, uh, and I mentioned, I didn't have a, a lot of uh, specifics on scholarships, but I wanna point out, you, you know, so we're expecting something like 900 new students in the fall. We do have an application process for some competitive scholarships that, that we offer um, to students who are coming in. And so we got hundreds of applications, not surprisingly um, for those. We have, and I was thinking about this before we got on here, we awarded about 40 scholarships to incoming students um, based on their um, application materials. And, and so some, you know, if you wanna keep a number in your head, something like 5% of the incoming class was awarded a, a scholarship for academic achievement um, coming into the, the college. We also award scholarships based on financial need. So it has nothing to do, like as long as you're in the College of Science and you've been admitted, if, you've, if you're identified on that federal financial aid form as having financial need, we also award um, a number of, of uh, need-based scholarships. So, so probably close to 10% or more of the incoming class will, will have a scholarship, whether it's merit-based or need-based or both. 
Um, this is something that's really interesting to me, and so I hope it's interesting to those of you who are joining us today. You, you know, we do have this office, you know, Megan and, and the Science Lion Pride group, they meet with, with families and they talk about the College of Science, and we tell the admissions office, you know, we're looking for about 850 or 900 new students. But other than that, the admissions office does all the work of, you, you know, taking applications and vetting them and deciding who's going to get an offer and who's not. And they have to estimate the potential yield, how many, if we award this many, or if we offer this many students admissions, how many are going to accept. Even though that process is done out of a completely different office, the numbers that come into the College of Science every year are really pretty consistent. So it was always amazing to me when back in my time in, in astronomy and astrophysics, for years and years and years, with you know, let's say 850 new students coming in every year, we would get almost always 25 new astronomy majors. Uh, that's since grown a little bit, but it just was amazing to me how consistent it was that out of the you know many tens of thousands of students who applied to Penn State. Um, when we picked an incoming class of a, roughly 850, roughly 25 of them want to be astronomers and roughly 200 to 300 want to be biologists, roughly 150 want to be mathematicians. And those numbers are really stable, which I, I find very interesting. And I wanted to, to share them all here with you. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question um, for you oh. in the Q&A from yep. John who asks, um, does the 800 to 900 include students coming to University Park through the two plus two ah. option? And how many students come that way? That's a great question. And, and, I, and now that you say that, I wish I had put a slide on that, right? So, so the, um, the two plus two program, right? So many students apply to Penn State and, and they are, uh, um, offered a spot at Mont Alto or New Kensington or Abington or Berks, et cetera. So they will identify that they wanna be in a College of Science major, but because they are starting out at another campus, they aren't included in these numbers. This is the University Park numbers starting um, with us from, from day one. So, um, one of the things I'm going to get to a couple slides from now is talk about, you know, what happens along the way, you know, so, so we start out with, let's say 850 students, not all 850 stay with us from start to finish. So I will totally confess, I don't have the number off the top of my head that start at the campuses identifying as a pre-major in the sciences, but I can tell you that those that come to us after two years uh, it's approximately 300. So um, we, we, in year three, after two years at their campus, about 300 students moved to, to University Park um, to continue in a, in a College of Science major. And so um, often that's pretty automatic, right? They, they do two years at Abington, say, they were doing the biology major, and then they um, press a button online and we know they're coming to UP for their third year. Every once in a while, again, there's, there's flexibility in that system. Uh, there, there are some students who just, their circumstances, they, they need to be at University Park earlier than, than year three. And, and so there's a, a mechanism for them to request that. And then our office evaluates them and either approves them or comes up with some other plan. Um, but, but two plus two adds about 300 students to the third year of the major. So, so that's when, when I get to the end and I talk about how many we graduated, you'll see we graduate more than start with us. And that's a lot of that is the, the students who come from the campuses. So thank you very much for that question because definitely relevant to, to what we're talking about. Um, I, I want to point out these pictures again, just to partly because I wanted these pictures to illustrate the variety, right? So, so I couldn't not include a picture of a cohort of astronomy and astrophysics students who I worked with. And so that's the top picture. It's not all of them. These pictures come from Welcome Day, the, the Sunday before the first day of classes um, uh, in the fall semester. So that group, there, there were roughly 30 new incoming astro majors and, and about half of them were in, in the picture. So right below that is a picture of the incoming biology cohort, right? So you can see, um, you, you know, I, I would always 
a lot of times like to compare, you know, the smallest majors to the biggest majors. So, so astro roughly 30, biology 200 plus, you know, sometimes as many as 300. So, so if you want to know how many more aspiring biologists there are than astronomers, it's about 10 times the number of, of people who want to be a biology uh, major than, than an astronomer. You know, if you look at this, this list of numbers here, um, and, and this is a, one of the things I always talk about when I mention, you know, my background uh, is in astronomy and astrophysics. I came from a department that, that had the smallest number of majors in the College of Science. And so these days I, you, you know, oversee this whole group of students in the college. And, you know, you can, you can look at this list and say, you know what, the College of Science is mostly life scientists, right? We have something like 200 to 300 new biologists, something like 200 to 300 new uh, pre-meds, something like 100 new biochemists, microbiology, biotechnology. So I've learned a lot about those programs in the last two years because they, they dominate our numbers, right? Half of the College of Science is made up of people who wanna be in the life sciences, whether they wanna go on to um, a career or a graduate school in that field or, or into medicine. Just one more aside while we're on the slide very quickly, um, and we're gonna we're gonna talk we're gonna compare these numbers at first day to what we graduate. And it was fun for me over the 20 years. I've gone to commencement in the spring a lot of years. And early on, like 2005, 2006, when I would go to commencement, it was always interesting to me who's gonna win. Are there gonna be more astronomers graduating or more statisticians? And so back then, you know, 15 years ago, it was neck and neck, you know, about a dozen of each. Like some years there'd be 12 astronomers and eight statisticians. And some years there would be 15 statisticians and 11 astronomers, right? Now look at it, right? Statistics in 2021, um, we get something like 50 students who want to do that. And, and for years now, they've been graduating uh, many more than Astro, but Astro is catching up. So, so those numbers have, have changed a bit. So, so following the trends has been interesting. All right, so, so here's where I want to address another thing head on, right? We have been talking for years, and, and I'm sure you know these words are not going to surprise you. Lots of people talk about, oh, do you remember such and such weed out class and from, from the college? Like, oh, that's, that's the class where they weed out the students from this or from that. And, and I don't know if anybody listening is going to believe me, but, but I want you to hear this from me and let me tell you that I fully believe everything I'm about to tell you. There is not a weed out class in the College of Science. And what I mean by that is that there is not a class where we look at it and say, okay, there's 100 students in this class. We need to make sure only 50 of them continue in the college. There's no one here who wants to do that. We say there's 100 students in that class. We want all 100 to have an opportunity to be successful and, and continue in the College of Science. Now, that being said, I, I will tell you, I my first year, I got a grade I had never seen before on a report card and, and it made me question, am I doing the right thing? Um, and so that happens, right? Students, you, you know, whether it's a math class or a physics class or a chemistry class or a biology class, like students who want to continue in the College of Science, they, they have some adversity. They experience a class or classes that really challenge them. And the people who are best at sort of working through that discussion with students are, are the advisors. So, I, so again, I, you know, this might sound like semantics to you, but I, but I want to say students flow in and out of the college. You know, we have 850 who start with us. Not all of those 850 are going to stay with us. And, and it might be hundreds of them who move out of the college into another major at Penn State. But the way I look at it again is I'm here to help students succeed. And so if that's what I'm here for, a student might come to me and say, you know, I I've been thinking about it and I think I wanna be an English major. And, and we talk about that and we talk about, well, why, like what's the root of that? What, what is it about that potential change? And sometimes the student says, well, you know, I'm really struggling in this class and it's making me question whether I can do it. And I say, well, let's talk about that. You, you know, 
what what was the cause of your struggles? What did you do to try and overcome them? And and sometimes students just need a little bit of a confidence boost, right? That that first time you get those exams back uh, in your first semester, sometimes it's a wake up call. But that doesn't mean again that there's anybody who's like, great, you know, this percentage of them failed, they're going to be gone. It's how do we talk to students about what comes next, what their options are? And I spent a lot of my time as an advisor in astronomy and astrophysics, again, talking to students. And sometimes they stuck around. Sometimes they said, you know what, you're right. I, I reflected on it. I bombed that one test. I have some things I can do to do better. I'm going to stick it out. And others said, you know what, my interests really just changed. I want to go do something else. And so um, Isaiah in this picture here um, with me and Cindy Myers, He's a student who start to finish worked with us in Astro and I was his advisor and I really enjoyed talking to him and he's in grad school now. And, and it was, you know, from, he was a student that, you know, start to finish, things just went well, he did okay. He was always in, in a good spot and, and he, his trajectory was the same. But I, I go back to this picture here and you know, I can look at this picture and say, okay, here's a couple of people who I who I remember from new student orientation who are graduating as astro majors. But there's a student in here who told me at new student orientation, oh, I'm not sure I want to do this anymore. Like this is what I'm really interested in. And I said, well, from what you're telling me, that sounds a little bit like anthropology, and that sounds a little. And and um, we talked and and. Uh, you, you know, I, I suggested some courses and that student changed majors and came back and said, I'm so glad we had that talk because I, I really found, you know, I started in your major because I thought that's what I wanted, but I'm now over here and I'm so much happier because I found what I want to do. And so that's that's what I'm sort of, you, you know, this is, slide is about advising, but but I brought up the idea of weed out because I really want people to understand that that's not our philosophy. Our philosophy is student success how do we advise students to find that success? And if it's with us, great. If it's with some other college or some other program, we'll help them with that as well. And, and so that's just you, you know, an important thing that I think all of us want people to know um, is, is underlies what we do here in the College of Science. So just to, you, you know, again, I want to make clear to people that there, there are lots of options. And, and you know, I, again, I just had a conversation with someone whose son is interested in, in forensic science, which we list under our interdisciplinary sciences. And there's lots of students who say, wow, you know, forensic science, I love the sounds of that. I really want to do that. I want to go into that field. But we know that, you know, college, especially your undergraduate years, is a time for exploration. And I just know that some students who come in as forensic science, you know what, after two years, they're like, you know what, I think what interested me most was the chemistry aspect of that. And so I always tell parents, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't use my time with people to try and convince them one way or the other. But I always say, like, make sure you're looking at this entire list, you know, and, and no one said that to me, like, I was one of those students who I was like, I'm 100% astro, you can't talk to me, I don't want to, but but I kind of wish someone had said to me, make sure you at least look at this list because there's probably other programs out there that our college offers that might be of interest to you. Um, and, and, you know, so I think that's an important message for, for people to hear. I'll, I'll just point out two things while we're on this slide. You know, I mentioned the growth of statistics. And so again, from the standpoint of sharing with people what, what opportunities are there in the College of Science, there's a major on here that many of you may have never heard of, um, but it's, it's data sciences and it's run out of the Department of Statistics. If you go to any job hunting site right now and just punch in like search for jobs in the field of data science, there are many of them. And there are studies that have shown that, that there are more jobs in data science than there are trained people to fill them. So what does that mean? That means it's a great opportunity for us to, to help fill that. And, and data science in the past, it was made up of a lot of people with science degrees, mathematics degrees, and stat degrees. So now we specifically offer a program um, and, and I, I call people's attention to that so that they know that that's a possibility uh, in the, through the College of Science. Chris, um, we have another question here from Steve. Um, coincidentally, speaking of statistics, um, 
do you have numbers on jobs available and the pay scales for each um, graduate in a major? Ooh, that's a great question. So I don't have them handy, like right in front of me, um, but I'll, I'll just say, you, you know, we have through the Office of Science Engagement, uh, we have a career coordinator. Again, for those of you who um, went through the college, many of you may remember uh, Anne-Marie Daniel. She, she's been at the university for a long time in, in a lot of different roles, but often related to careers. She teaches a class in um, careers that, that students can take towards the end of their, their time, like when they're, they're in their third or fourth year and are thinking. So she's our, our resident expert on all of that. And I'm sure if she were with us today, she'd just give me the table. I can tell you that when that question comes up to me directly, like what can I show my um, child about opportunities? I always refer people to the professional societies for these fields. So for example, in the physical sciences, there's the American Institute of Physics and the AIP puts out uh, a report every year on graduates and where they go and how much, and, and I'm remembering off the top of my head from a couple of years ago, so it's a little bit outdated, but in physics and astrophysics, the, the, the um, average starting salary with a bachelor's degree is over 60,000. And so that, like, if you want to know where that comes from, it's from the AIP. And so, so I would think, you know, if you're interested, you know, what's the average starting salary, a number of opportunities for chemists, you would go to the American Chemical Society, right? Or, or for mathematicians, um, the American Mathematical Society. So, so I don't have those off the top of my head. I can try and uh, get uh, some information through Anne Marie to share with everyone who joined us today. Um, but I would just suggest that people look at the, the um, professional societies for the different uh, fields. So thank you for the question. I apologize I didn't give maybe the best answer to that one. <laughs> um, but before we move on from this slide, one of the other things I want to call people's attention to, and it goes right to, to that question, I think, is that, you know, a lot of the students who come in to, you know, some of the, the you know, what maybe air quotes traditional majors like biology or physics or chemistry or math, um, their, their intentions are graduate school. But we know that there are a lot of students who want a career in industry. They want to combine their, their scientific background with, with a, um, you know, a four, take a four-year degree, get a job where they can uh, make use of their, their scientific training. And so we do have this program that's listed on the bottom right here, the Science BS MBA program. Um, it's a, it's in, in Penn State lingo, it's an integrated undergraduate graduate degree. So you, you start out in the undergraduate degree, you get a Bachelor of Science in, in Sciences, uh, but then you roll into the, the MBA program through the Smeal College of Business. And so uh, there's a couple of pathways through that program. I think one takes five years and one takes six years. Um, but, and it's not a huge number of students um, who, who start in that, but uh, you know, the students who, who have that interest, who can say early on in their career, I wanna go uh, into industry, this is a great program for them. So it's another one we call attention to because if you're thinking about going to the College of Science, you're probably thinking chemistry, biology, physics. You might not be thinking about, you know, what comes after that more very specifically. But if, if you know, the intersection of, of science and industry really um, speaks to you, the BSMBA program is a, is a great one. And we're, we're working hard to, to grow the numbers there. Um, uh, because we think it's it's a really nice program for, for students interested in, in science. Okay, so, so I'm keeping an eye on the time. I promise not to go too long, um, but I really want to talk about engagement and, and co-curricular experiences for, for a little bit. We want students, while they're in the college, we want them to get experiences teaching we want them to get experiences doing research with, with our faculty or, or maybe even at other institutes. Um, we really want our students to go abroad if, that, if that's something that's really important to them. And, and I hear, I get questions about that a lot. Like, can I go um, do a study abroad program through the, through the College of Science? Um, I, I mentioned Anne-Marie Daniel a few moments again, uh, a few moments ago. We students have lots of questions about being prepared to apply for jobs. Like, how do I write a resume for for an industry that's looking for chemists or biologists? Um, students who are interested in industry are really interested in internships. Like, how do I get an internship with Merck 
or with Lockheed Martin or with, with one of the many companies that um, recruits our students. So we have an Office of Science Engagement um, that, that works with a lot of these. The, the Learning Assistant Program is, is uh, through a different office, um, but that's specifically focused on teaching. But we consider that part of, like these are all these co-curricular experiences. And what students and families hear from me, and, and I've said it once already, but I'm gonna say it twice because it's so important. People study these things, right? Like, like you can look up research that says, students who do a co-curricular experience like research or like study abroad, they have better GPAs, they graduate sooner, they have more success finding employment, they have higher salaries when they start employment. So, so all the metrics that we, we look at for student success tell us that these experiences are important. So because they're so important, we want to make sure that, that students are aware they exist. We want to support them. Um, so, so one example is, you know, if you look at this list, you know, study abroad is, is an expensive proposition. You know, if you want to go to um, Tanzania to study a, a biology with um, Professor Doug Kavanagh, um, that's not cheap. So we have scholarship programs. Again, you know, very thankful to all of our uh, alumni um, who, who donated to those, but, but it, it really helps make these experiences available to everyone when we can say, yes, we want you to apply for study abroad. And yes, there's a scholarship available to help offset the cost. Um, uh, it, you know, as always, there's always more demand than there is maybe supply of scholarships, but, um, but we do our best. And, and so we really uh, um, try hard to make sure that if a student wants to be a part of something that we can make it available to them. Um, as long as we're talking about funding, I want to talk about undergraduate research. That, that's another one that many, many students participate in research. Uh, sometimes it's for credit, like you, you work on a research project and you get a grade, but there are a number of funded research projects. So you can earn money while, while getting experience in your field. Besides through the college, the university really strongly supports undergraduate research. And there's this program called the Erickson Discovery Grant. And there's a new program um, through the Student Engagement Network where students can get funding uh, to participate in their research. And those are just fantastic because again, they help make it um, so that anybody can, can get this experience regardless of, of their personal means. Um, again, because I promised to give you numbers, we survey our graduating students and we say, you know, how many of you um, taught we're, we're a learning assistant? And so in this picture here, you're seeing our big classroom and this is one of our big classes and all the students you see standing up in the aisles, they're learning assistants. So a class that let's say has 500 students in it, they might have 20 undergraduate learning assistants helping students work on some small group work in, in during their class. This is for some of you like me who graduated from Penn State a long time ago, you might think, wow, that's interesting. But this, this model has really grown in the last um, five to 10 years. And, and so, so many of our classes use, use learning assistants. And that means there's lots of opportunities for students to be a learning assistant for a chem or a physics or a biology class. Um, so roughly 60% of our students uh, in, our, in our senior survey tell us that they taught, uh, whether it was as a learning assistant or a similar program as an undergraduate. Roughly 50% of our students participated in undergraduate research while they were here with us. And roughly 33% of our students do an internship. Now, that internship number might seem low, but for the College of Science, like this is the thing, like, and I'll go back here. These are all co-curricular experiences. And you could say like the idea behind an internship is for a student to work side by side with a mentor where they're gonna learn something about the field that they're gonna go in. Well, research is that, and an internship at a company might be research, but at the company rather than in a lab here. So I think really to think about our numbers in terms of hands-on experience in the field, I might add those together. And some students might call what they're doing research when it was an internship in air quotes. And some people might call what they did an internship when it was research. So those things are a little bit fuzzy, but, but if you add them together, something like 83% of our students um, got a, uh, a hands-on co-curricular experience in the field. 
Um, so, so I want to make sure that people know, you, you know, it's nice to be able to say that something like three quarters to 80% of our students are doing teaching research or something else um, uh, before they graduate, but we want, we would love for that number to be 100%. So we're trying to grow those opportunities all the time. So, so just to start wrapping up here, so we have time for a few more questions. Um, I want to make sure that people know that, what, you know, again, from the student success standpoint, when our students graduate, that they're ready, whether they want to go right into employment or they want to go into a graduate school or professional school. Um, we, our college is the home for the pre-medicine degree, but we're not the only college that produces students that go on to medical school. So, so you know, Penn State is a college of health and human development. Um, but, but honestly, medical school is open to anyone who wants to become an MD. So there are plenty of students in the, you know, the College of Liberal Arts, for example, who want to go to med school. So if you want to go to medical school, the, um, we have an advising center for students who are on that track, and it's open to anyone. So if you're in HHD and you're doing their um, major in biobehavioral health, but you want to go to medical school, you can still work with one of our pre-health advisors on your medical school applications. Um, so, so we actually serve a really large population of students who are on that track. Um, you know, interestingly to me, many of our students come into the college and their questions are all about graduate and professional school. I want to go to med school. I want to go into a PhD program. But the long-term average is roughly 50% of our students do go to graduate school or med school. So 50% of them usually go into employment, right? And, and so we want to make sure that students are hearing that not again, not from the, we need to force some fraction of students into one path or another, but we just want students to know that, you, you know, roughly half our students go to graduate or professional school. So, so the other half go into industry or, 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 you know, related um, pathways. So we want to make sure they know what those pathways are. Like, who do you talk to if you, you know, you're going to apply to a place like Merck or Pfizer, et cetera. And so that's the, um, you know, our career coordinator. One of the things I've really enjoyed over the years, um, lots of our students, when, when they're finishing up, you know, especially if they've been involved in, in, as a learning assistant or they've been involved in an outreach program, they say, what about becoming a science teacher? Like, you know, so Penn State does have a college of ed and we have programs um, specifically designed for people to become high school science teachers. But what if someone's a chemist and then their senior year, they're like, I would love to be a chemistry teacher. Well, there are programs for that. So we make sure to connect people to the right people to learn about um, getting uh, um, certification to become a science teacher. And I've really enjoyed working specifically with a couple of students who've gone that path. So, so again, same pictures, but different table this time. This is the sum total of students who graduated summer of 20 plus fall of 20 plus spring of 21. Um, so, so if you remember back to those numbers, I said, oh, we have usually more than 200 biology majors who start with us. We graduated 280 biology majors in the last uh, academic year. Uh, we have roughly 30 astronomers who start with us. This is, I think, a, a record, 42 astronomers and planetary scientists graduated from Penn State in the last year. 204 mathematicians. Look, look, statistics and data science blew Astro out of the water this year, 111 to 42. So no more 12 and one and eight and the other. So those numbers are really interesting. Um, one thing I've, I've said in other forums that I, I think it'd be interesting to talk about here. If you remember back to that, that slide of how many students come in, the pre-medicine number was really high. We would start out with 200 plus students who said, I came in as pre-med. Why did we only graduate 44? So again, you're going to, you're probably going to, oh, you tried to convince me you aren't weeding out people. Did you weed out 160 pre-meds? And the answer is no. Um, we had, I, I didn't have this line, the science BS. So, so the general science major is, a, is an option in the college, and it's one of those that students, like if, if a student is interested in becoming an MD, when they're in high school, they're like, well, I'm going to go to college and be a pre-med. Well, when they get here, they learn you don't have to be a pre-med major to go to medical school. You can be a biology major to go to medical school. You can be a physics major. 
And when those students learn about the general science major, which has a little bit more flexibility in what courses you can take, many students who want to go to med school choose the, pre, uh, the science major over pre-med. So, so we still graduate a, a lot of students from the pre-med, but we graduate more in the general science major because they just like it better. Um, and and so, so all told, the students just shuffled and sorted themselves a little bit differently uh, than, than when they came in. And uh, Chris, um, while you're on the pre-med sure. topic, um, we did get in the uh, in the chat a quick question here around is, from Lamar: Is this is the number of medical school student applicants from the university increasing, decreasing, Ooh. or staying about the same? That's a really great question, and it's it, it's a little bit of a hard one to answer. The most recent information I got from our pre-health advising folks is that it's fluctuated. So it's, it's gone up and down a little bit. So um, that might be one I, I should probably get better information from them and come back to you. Um, but I would say, you, you know, at least in my experience in talking with students, um, you know, when we do our accepted students programs or our spend a summer day where people are just checking us out, we get more questions about I want to come to Penn State and go on to medical school. Like, what are my options? What major should I do? What? Um, and and you, you know, I didn't specifically mention it here. Um, we do have a small program that actually goes back to the 1960s. It's uh, uh it's called the Pre Med Med um, degree. It's it's a partnership between Penn State and um, Sydney Kimmel. And so students do three years at Penn State and then they go right to um, Sydney Kimmel uh, into medical school. That program, um, we, we have something like 25 or 30 um, who we, we sort of target every year coming into that. We get more applications for that program than almost anything else. And, and the interest in the College of Science for that program is incredibly high. So I would just say, I, I, I know in a talk about numbers, you probably want me to give more data. So I'll have to promise that I, I can follow up with that. But I would just say that everything I see from the students who are asking us questions, from the students who are applying our, for our scholarships, um, we hear, I want to be pre-med, I want to be pre-med med, I want to go to medical school in, in large numbers. So while it might fluctuate a little bit, it's the, the trend is still very strong. Uh, interest in, in that field. All right, so again, keeping an eye on time. Um, this is actually my last slide. So, so, so I'll just sort of try to tie things up in a little bit of a bow, but then I'm happy to answer some more questions. Um, so, so we started out with, again, something like 850 students each year, actually, for this particular fall. Uh, our final number um, uh, of students who accepted their offer to come to the College of Science was 901. Um, but over the last academic year, we graduated 1,097 students between summer 20 and spring 21. And so that number does include students who changed majors into the college. It includes students who changed majors out of the college and it includes change of campus. So we start out with 900 at UP, we lose some of them, we gain some from other colleges, we gain some from the campuses, um, and we lose some to transfers, and we graduate something like 1,100 uh, uh, in, an, in a calendar year. Um, I, and I just wanna say like, you know, from my perspective, the thing I keep in mind, right? We, we support students' admissions through commencement and the cycle is ongoing. Um, you know, it's so exciting to me that we have 900 students coming into the college. I'm, I'm really looking forward to Welcome Day, where we're going to do some programs to, you know, welcome everyone to campus and, and uh, the college. But at the same time, we're starting to think about, you know, okay, we've got to set up our scholarship application for um, students who want to join us in the fall of 22. Uh, we've got to have the meeting with admissions about, you know, our, our enrollment target for, uh, for, for next year's class. So, so it's it's ongoing, you know. You know, it's it, and and it, it just you know, from my perspective, the great thing about this job is is you know it is student facing. It is you, you know again student success and and it's what can we do 
to make sure that students are welcomed into the college, feel like there's all of us here are, are here for them, have their back, want them to be successful. We'll do what we can to, to make that happen and then celebrate and shake their hand and, and congratulate them at, at commencement. So, so, you know, from start to finish, it's just a fun role to be in. Um, and, and I've really, you know, again, I, one thing I'll say for sure, sure, I really enjoy working with students all across the college. I do get teased a little bit. I've got a picture of the stars behind me. All of my stories are from working with astronomy students, but, but you know, in this role, I've worked so much more with the pre-med students and the biology students and the math students and the stat students and the chemistry students and the physics students. And it's, it's really been great getting to know all of the students in the college and, and um, you know, just letting them know I'm, one, I'm part of the team here for them. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. I'll just remind uh, everyone if, if you do have a question, um, just put it into the Q&A um, box in, in here and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. While we're waiting for um, any of those to come in, Chris, I, you know, I, I have a question, um, you know, which is, do we, does the college have any statistics on um, how many people in a particular major actually go on to work in that particular field? Um, that's a great question. In other words, um, let me give you an example, right? Yeah. So I was a math major. Mm -hmm. um, I graduated with a math degree. I think back then it was called the systems analysis option. So mm -hmm. it had a little bit of computer, a little yeah. bit of business, you know, mixed in. I've spent my career in IT, so kind of, sort of. You know, yeah. I've been in that space, but um, I'm curious because I work with a lot of people that have biology degrees or chemistry degrees and happen to have their career in IT. So, it, it, you know, it's interesting. I, I would say, you know, from my perspective, the numbers that we work with are, are, you know, it's always what question are we trying to answer, right? And so for me, the kinds of questions I'm always trying to answer are, you know, where are the roadblocks in the College of Science? Where can we do things to, to you know help students you know who you know have some challenge along the way you know I'm, I'm very interested in you know where do our majors go but the our questions sort of end at graduation right like um, the ones that you know from the standpoint of what do I need to know like I need to be able to talk with with this group and I also need to be talk be able to talk with families about you know, where have our students gone? What are they doing? Because I want them to know those pathways, but I don't necessarily need to know like for every major, every student in this major 10 years from now, what are they doing? Those are the kinds of questions I bet, um, you know, our, our friends from uh, uh, alumni relations, I, I bet those are things they're interested in for some of their purposes. So, so I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, the alumni association has data on that, um, uh, Etc. But it's not a question that I've investigated personally in detail because it ha it it hasn't been one that I've necessarily needed to answer for the things that I've been trying to to accomplish. Um, yeah. No, I I totally get it. Um, you know, and the reason for the question is that you know when when I've talked to some students along the way and they've said so what you know I've been thinking about majoring in this right you know yeah. what is it that that opens it up, you know, what can I do when I graduate with that degree? And I, I use obviously a personal example and, and others that I work with that are not in the, the same field. It's really, you know, giving you that foundation. But, um, you know, certainly the College of Science gives you a lot of flexibility, right? With all of the, you know, majors that we do offer across multiple disciplines within science to um, to do that. So it's, it's, it's a great, Thing, but just you know, as as students are beginning to try and say, you know, am I locked in once I pick a major that now all of a sudden if I'm chemistry I got to be a chemist, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, I, I will just say in general the message, and it's helpful to have statistics. It's also helpful to have anecdotes like, did you know about this student who did this major and is now doing this, right? So I think that's as interesting as you know the statistics, but. I, I did, and, and this goes back to my time in Astro as opposed to my time in the college, but I would often talk to families and I would use those anecdotes. I would say, here's a student who's working for this company and using their degree in this way. 
we've had lots of students who've gone, you know, broadly speaking into the defense industry, whether it's, you know, Lockheed Martin or Ball Aerospace or Orbital ATK or Northrop Grumman, et cetera. So I did a couple of years ago, I looked at all of the students who graduated from the spring of 2012 through the spring of, I think it was 2018 um, with an astro major. And, and if I had, if I knew where they were, I, um, you, you know, could list what they were doing now. And for that group, it was pretty bang on to what I was telling people, you know, about 50% of them went on to graduate school and were pursuing a career in academia about 25 to 30% of them were in industry. And a lot of that broke down to um, the defense industry was a big one, but also data science. Data science is really hiring people with lots of different science degrees. Uh, and then about 15% were in formal or informal education, you know, as a high school science teacher working at a science center, um, you, you know, working at like a nature center, things like that. So, so, you know, when I actually did the study, uh, it backed up my hunches or, or my, you, you know, sort of what I just estimated off the top of my head from, from sort of keeping in mind where alumni had gone. Great. Well, I don't see any other questions um, that have come in yet. Um, so, you know, let me just take this opportunity, uh, Chris, to thank you for, for this presentation. It was fantastic. Fantastic, um, you know, info. I know, you know, I learned a lot um, from from what you had shared, um, you know, and really, you know, it gave me kind of a new perspective on um, what the College of Science is doing today um, versus, uh, you know, what it what it was, um, you know, back when when I was in the College of Science. Um, so, you know, hopefully that was, you know, also struck a chord with everybody else here that joined us for the call. Um, you know, and uh, don't know if you want to, you know, offer any kind of parting comments here uh, at the end and we'll, we'll uh, send sure. everybody off. I'll, I'll say two parting comments. So thing number one is, you know, I, sh I, I will absolutely say to the alumni relations folks, alumni relations is your job, not mine, but I love talking to alumni. So if, if you want to drop me a note and just have a question, want to follow up on something like this, um, uh, you, you know, I can say my email address, but it's just as easy just to look it up in the College of Science, but I'm cxp137 at psu.edu. I would welcome people to email me uh, and, and share any thoughts they had. The other parting thing I want to say is that, you, you know, one of the things I really enjoy about this job too is, is being an alum and being at Penn State. You, you know, there's, there's a number of us throughout the college and throughout the university who went here. And, and I, I really, you know, going back to what you were just saying, I think it really informs the work I do because Penn State is not the same place as it was in the 19, early 1990s. But at the same time, I can tell students, like I sat in the same classroom as you, I took the same courses. Some of the faculty I took are still here, um, which is a lot of fun. I, I can tell my colleagues now that I took chem with them or I took physics with them. Um, but, but it's, you know, having that shared experience of having, you know, I was a first gen student, I was from out of state. Um, I had to get used to living in the residence halls with someone I didn't know, you, you know, and I know that experience is common throughout different colleges, but having been able to do it here, I think really did give me some perspective on, on how to talk to and work with Penn State students. So I'm glad that I can relate to them in that manner when I'm thinking about, you know, how do I help the student with whatever they need me to help with. Um, but I, but again, I just, you know, if you remember one thing from this presentation, Please remember that that you know our goal in the college is for every single student to find success at Penn State, no matter what that is. Like that can be defined so many different ways, but that's what we tell them when they start, and that's what we're, where we're helping them get to when they finish. Great. Well, thanks again, Chris, um, and thank you everyone for joining us today, and we'll uh, look forward to seeing you at the the next event. Great. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>